What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the My Other Passion Podcast. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports. And today on the podcast, we have the founder of recovery tech and wellness company, Hyperice, Anthony Katz. No doubt you've heard of this brand. You've seen it. They have partnerships with the NBA, NFL, UFC. They work with athletes like John Morant. Naomi Osaka. Anthony has a really interesting story. He grew up in Laguna Beach, and he was a history teacher, he was a basketball coach, and he took this vision that he had for how athletes can extend their prime and then turn it into this company. And a decade later, they're having a ton of success. I thought most interesting in a lot of ways is the way that you know his love for music, fashion, film, art, you know, growing up in the 90s and the way the counterculture really took hold during that era. All of that has really influenced how he looks at business. Uh, he had really interesting stories about his relationship with LeBron James, with Kobe Bryant. I can't wait for you all to hear the conversation. Let's go ahead and get right into it. But first, let's take a break for a quick message from our partners at NetSuite. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's true when your business is growing fast, but that's even more true when there's a lot of uncertainty. Inflation is running rampant. Supply chains are clogged. The labor market is tight. What does that mean for your margins? Well, not every business is in the dark. In fact, over 31,000 businesses know everything about their numbers because they use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite is going to give you the visibility and control over your financials, planning, budgeting, inventory, everything else you need so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. NetSuite is also going to help you identify rising costs, automate your manual business processes, and ultimately see where to save money. Know your numbers, know your business, and get to know how NetSuite can be the source of truth for your entire company. Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you got to do is head over to NetSuite.com slash MyOtherPassion and get set up with everything you need to make it happen. NetSuite.com slash MyOtherPassion. Go ahead, take your company to the next level. You won't regret it. Now, let's get back to the conversation with Anthony Katz. Anthony Katz, what's up? Welcome to the My Other Passion podcast. Good to be with you, Ernest. How's it going today? Uh, it's a nice sunny day, as usual, in Southern California. So, uh, yeah, uh, another day back at the grind. No, I feel you. I'm, you know, I'm over here with you a little bit further north up in L.A., but, you know, you can definitely count on some sun. Sometimes, Do you ever – you're from here. You're from – like Laguna Beach. So are you just completely yeah. used to it or do you ever get tired of like perfect weather every day? Uh, no. What's your, what's I, your opinion? I, I, if, it could, if it could be 85 every day, 365, I would take it. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a beach bum and I love on the weekends to get down, get out in the sun with my kids and get in the water. And, uh, that's pretty much if I'm not working, if I'm not, not working and then I'm, I'm, I play basketball two days a week. And uh, on the weekends, it's pretty much reserved for uh, beach time with the kids, and uh, so that's that's a pretty much simple life of the of the entrepreneur dad life uh, mix. Yeah, the beach is a constant fixture in our lives. Um, I'm trying to get out and see more, though. Like you know, a lot of times I'll go up to Malibu um, or even uh, what is it, Will Rogers, but. I want to. I haven't really properly gone down to to Orange County to Laguna. Um, I think there's like some famous cove or something that I want to see. Like I we we were at the U.S. Open of surfing in Huntington Beach a few weekends ago, which was mm-hmm. sweet. But I just yeah, I want to see more of the coast. Yeah, Huntington's more more flat. So like there's just like a lot. Of, it's a big flat open stretch of beach. Laguna, you get into the beautiful topography of like the cliffs, and it's just cove after cove after cove. So yeah, if you haven't been down, uh, yeah, it's definitely different. You feel like you're in a different place. All right, well, I'll make that happen. Um, again, really nice to be speaking with you today, having you join the pod. Um, I personally, and I think most people who follow this space type of stuff that we cover at Front Office Sports or even who's just a fan of sports and, and consuming media these days um, is familiar in some capacity with Hyper Ice, your brand. And you launched Hyper Ice in, I've seen 2010 and 2012, like obviously it's er, an early 2010s um, move, but, but yeah, what was, how were those early days for you? I, I have a lot of questions, but just open-ended, you know, where were you at in life that, yeah. that made you want to make the jump and, and get into the recovery tech business? Yeah, the, the founding date is always sort of like up in the air because the, the, the in, in 2010, technically, you know, like 
started doing the R and D on the first product. The product wasn't really commercially available on, online until 2012, but we had, we were at the time we were selling some prototypes as early as 2011. So it's sort of a moving target as to when the company was founded. But for me personally, like, you know, I was, I had just turned 30 and, um, you know, I, I had zero business experience. I really never thought about being an entrepreneur. I never uh, really didn't have much interest in, uh, I always associated corporate America with a desk job and that's something I wanted to avoid at all costs. Um, I was a high school history teacher and a basketball coach. And there was two things I liked. I liked being around young people. Um, and I liked history, I liked basketball. Um, and it was a way for me to stay in touch with the game it was a way from like that to kind of like satisfy the kind of sort of competitive side that, um, that I, that I still had, but also, um, you know, you know, teaching and being in the relationship centered profession around young people was something that I was pretty content with. And so never really, it wasn't like I was miserable in my job and wanted to do something else. It was just, you know, I, I, I sort of just had this idea and decided to run with it. And, and sort of like, once I started running with it, I, um, I, I saw an opportunity and, and just continue to run. And, um, you know, that, you know, that's sort of the, where I was at at the time. I, I wasn't, I wasn't someone who was, I, I really can't stress enough how I really literally knew zero. I mean, if you can know zero about how to start a business, how to, you know, how to, how to raise money, how to do all that stuff. And it was really the, the skills I learned is, a teacher and a basketball coach is just really about putting relationships first and being a relationship centered person because in coaching and in teaching, there's no transactions. It's not a transactional profession. So you don't see people as this sort of people you're going to do deals with or trans do transactions with you. You see people who you have to earn their trust, you have to earn their respect and being a, in a relationship centered profession for years uh, served me well in, in business. And I think that, some people always say like, oh, wow, you know, you were a high school teacher and then you did all this. It seems like it's an unlikely transition, but I actually think that it really prepared me well because I brought like, I, I didn't have any sort of baked in preconceived notions about what the business world was like. Um, I think the naivete sort of helped me in a weird way. Um, there's a lot of things I wish I did different, obviously in the beginning, but um, I, I, do, I do think that it's always something that I believe strongly in that being a relationship centered person and, and um, putting people first is always a, a is a very good like sort of broad approach to business, and um, it's yeah, something that trans, I think is certainly transition. Well. Yeah, the transition. Um, you know, I've read about and hearing you talk about it now, going from history teacher, basketball coach, into being the founder of Hyper Ice. I understand why most people are say you know it seems unlikely. Um, one thing that I love though, and like kind of want to get across with this show is like to dispel notions of what's likely or unlikely. And really, like you said, I can't emphasize enough about how little I know and look at yourself a decade later, look at the company a decade later. I think, you know, there's a lesson in that. There's a lot of inspiration to find in that. Um, but I'm curious, you're, you're not who you were 10 years ago. I mean, none of us were, but we can very tangibly look at your company and see the growth and the trajectory. Do you feel like, the business world and the corporate world and these things that maybe you had like apprehension about before have rubbed off in you in a sense. And you do sort of like approach situations, thinking about the deal, thinking about transactions more, like how do you retain these core values that I've seen you bring up in all these interviews while you got, you have deals, UFC, NBA, NFL, premier league teams, PGA tour, like you're all over the place. In fact, one of the, things about hyper ice is like how many deals i've seen you all you know and partnerships i've seen you all come out with over the past couple of years and like just what's the balance between you know anthony who started this and someone who's seen a lot of success but is also trying to hold on to like your vision of how you know a business should operate uh well i I, I would go to, I point to a, a, a song. It's one of my kids' favorite songs. It's a song by Arcade Fire. It's called Wake Up. And um, it's, it's sort of about growing older. And there's this line that says, um, uh, it says, now that I'm older, my heart colder. And it says, um, you know, children wake up. Um, you know, our bodies get bigger, but our hearts get torn up. And 
uh, whenever I hear that, I, I think so much about like, you know, you go into this profession, like um, from a profession of where it's really centered around kids and you, you meet families because, you know, you're coaching, you get kids and their families and their siblings. And sometimes I had kids that I had coached their, their brothers as well. Um, and then in teaching, like, you know, you see these kids, this is like this one time in their life that they get to do like high school is, you know, or middle school is you get to do it one time. And, um, you know, there, it, I think the education and coaching attract a certain type of person. It attracts a person that's really not motivated by money. Cause those are the people that go into that profession. If money was their main objective, they would not become teachers or high school coaches. So I was surrounded by people that kind of like-minded and there was, a, just a different sort of uh, community that you're associated with. When I got into business and where I go back to the lines of that song of like, you know, um, now that I'm older, my heart colder, it's sort of, you get to see that like people that do deals for a living or transactions for a living, or, um, you know, have sort of been like put through the ringer of like corporate America, I feel uh, are a little bit jaded. And then I think that it's like, you know, because something's happened to them, they're like, okay, well I have, you know, you know, it changes their view. And so you get people that are, you know, I saw it all the time. I remember the first time seeing people that were like, wow, they're, that, that person's just completely, you know, self-interested and has zero regard for anybody else. And like, it's just, it, it's sort of this like Machiavellian, like the ends justify the means mentality. And I think that was hard for me at first. Cause I was like, you know, like, who are these people? These are, these are not the type of people that, and this is kind of more like in the investment kind of business world. And I feel like, I never wanted to let that like change me um, and I would never want to become that, but I just became more aware of it. It's like, okay, you're not, you're, you're not in like, you're not, you're not surrounded by a bunch of people that are really just into it for good reasons and, and, you know, care about, you know, a different sort of set of values. And these people are really here to make money or make money for their clients or make money for their businesses. And so I had to like, you know, you know, the species has to adapt to the environment, right? The environment doesn't adapt to the species. So for me, going from one environment to, from like the coaching, teaching environment to the business environment, I just, it took me a while to realize, whoa, like, okay, this is a, a set of different rules and ethics. And, um, you know, you never have to like succumb and, and, be, and, and operate that way, but you have to know how people are operating around you. And I think that was sort of, the, that was sort of the biggest thing. And like, you know, I, I really just do believe that transactions just you know, in the end don't matter. Um, you know, they'll, no one will remember them. Um, the, 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 some of the transactions you were talking about is like our partnerships with leagues. They only matter because they're the byproduct of like the fact that we had people here that made great products together. And those products had an impact on the athletes or in the broader culture. And that it opened up the door for those opportunities. So those opportunities essentially are like byproducts of of us, you know, you know, kind of, you know, sort of, you know, co-creating this. Industry creating something that matters. Creating something yeah, that yeah. matters. Like we, we met, right. um, we met up Super Bowl week, and I remember it really stuck with me because you were talking about just how like important the physicality of of product is to you in this like metaverse landscape you know, just the joy of opening something up. And like, I could see the Apple influence in, in the design, you know, the packaging. Um, so I definitely understand, you know, where you're coming from and, and how you're looking at business. And it made me think of another quote. I love like figuring out life through song lyrics and quotes. So I like that you brought up Arcade Fire, but it reminds me sort of um, Jay-Z, classic um show you how to move in a room full of vultures like i i think that line is a classic 20 years later because it's you know he's really just saying look you have to when you get in these rooms to yeah. find success in them you have to really like understand how to maneuver through them um but yeah. it's cool to hear that from you too because i think a lot of times these partnerships these announcements like it's almost just like the clout to them. It's the name. It's the, it's to be able to say, we work with this person and that person. And no doubt there's like an appeal to that, but you're saying, well, we work with them because Tottenham or the Lakers or the NFL or whoever there's value in having our product. It's not just like yeah. a clout endeavor. Yeah. And, and to me, I remember when, 
when the the first one we did was the NBA, and and I remember the day that we announced it. You know, one of the NBA trainers who I have a good relationship with hit me, and he said, "He goes, well, you just made it official, but this was kind of been going on for a long. Like, you know, the leagues and the teams choose the players ultimately, and the players and training staffs and training staffs they they choose products that are going to like make a measurable difference in in their routines, right? Whether it's recovery, movement prep, body maintenance, whatever the you know, whatever the athletes sort of goes into their craft. And we had sort of broken into that and, you know, high price that Normatech had. And so like putting the stamp of, of approval on it from the league or making it official was in some ways anticlimactic because, you know, if anyone's been following the brand for a long time, I mean, I go all the, I have photos on my phone of guys on the sidelines from like 2012 using our first product, right? So we had been in, the NBA culture for a long time, the NFL culture for a long time. And it was sort of memorializing the last 10 years, but it wasn't like something we were just like, Hey, we're a big company now. We're just going to pay for some sponsorship. And that was always my fear of like how it would look is it was like, Hey, we're, we were a big company. So now we could, now we could do those types of transactions. It was really more, no, this is, this, this was earned over 10 years and, and going out going back to what Norma Tech was doing before they were, before we were the same company. Um, you know, high price and Normatech had just sort of established herself as the two dominant players in, in the space. And that's why we were able to sort of memorialize those, those league partnerships um, was because we had earned it. And, and, and that was sort of one thing that I was you know, really adamant about making clear. How does it feel as a founder? To me, one of the, one of the best moments, it, it reminds me of a couple other like iconic sort of like guerrilla marketing type of situations. Uh, and I'd love to understand a little of the backstory behind it, but Kevin Durant sitting courtside, he's a Theragun person and he's using hyper ice product. Like what is that? Yeah. How do you respond to that when that happens? How does that feel? Yeah. So I met Kevin when he was like probably 20 years old. I mean, I met him when I very, like, I don't even know had hyper ice even been formed yet i i my wife's uncle rex Kalamian, who's been an nba assistant coach for like 25 years was the assistant for oklahoma city and i went up to their workout when i was kind of like had a prototype of the of the hyper ice and at the time i remember um kevin's like oh yeah no like i don't ice and then um and then i i, I probably like a year later i saw him at lebron's charity game and that was like the second time i met him and by then it was like, okay, like he had gone through like his second or third year in the league. I think he was probably three years in, four years in maybe. And it was like, okay, like now my body really is starting to like, you know, we always reach the age where you, you know, you, you're invincible and you feel fine. And it's a harder recovery is a harder sell to, to younger athletes. But then, you know, you put a couple 82 game seasons in the rear view and the body definitely, you, you start to develop like, okay, like now I really need to start, start adding this and implementing it to my craft. Cause Kevin was just such a, like, just like a gym rat. And um, so I met Kevin 2011, you know, I think I met him the first time 2010. And then, you know, he really was a guy that was receptive to new things that would come out. I remember when I had the Viper uh, prototype, I think we made like, you know, the first 20 Vipers, which is the, the, the vibration roller, which is a very much a performance product. And I remember going up to his house in Beverly Hills in the summer of 2014. And he was like playing video games and he like got on the ground and used it. And so like Kevin was a guy and then I would, and then we, high price did stuff with USA basketball. So Kevin was a big part of USA basketball. So I'd see him every couple of years. And um, I think that, you know, I don't know how his deal with, uh, I don't think he's a marketing deal. I think he might've invested in their body, but um, yeah, you know, it's like, so. we, 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 we have, we, we like, it's like, we have LeBron and his camp invested. So I feel like there's always this like, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they don't really appear in the same brands much other than Nike. But um, I remember that, like, I just said, like, hey, guys are going to use, if, if there's something that they're going to use that's going to help them, they're going to use it. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't really super surprised. And I, I have no, if I, I, if I saw Kevin now, I have no, like, ill feelings or anything. Like, I, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of guys that are responsible right there. But Paul George was a guy that I met when he was 19. He's a therapeutic guy. And I, like, I understand that 
you know, there's monetary reasons why guys do deals and it's, I, I don't hold that against them personally. So, um, but when Kevin, yeah, when it was brought to my attention. Well, I just, I more so just thought it was cool. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I was more just like, okay, that makes sense. Like he's on the bench. We have, like, that's sort of the power of our deal. Like we have the on court license for, for technology. So if he's on the bench and he wants to do something, he really doesn't have much of a choice. So, um, I feel that that was a, uh, that like, you know, I, I like, I've always liked Kevin and continue to, to think he's a, he's, he's always been good to me. And, and, uh, yeah, if, if anything, it, it felt good to see it. Yeah. I, I find whenever, um, a space is sort of in like a nascent phase, ultimately I think recovery tech is, is new in a lot of ways. Like, talking about a decade here there was obviously methods before then but you know i see people who have these products and who have hypervolts and stuff who just weren't didn't have access to things like that you know when i was playing ball in high school in the 2000s so us teenagers did not have stuff like that on the sidelines now you see that um so yeah every everything that happens as like companies are trying to really determine who's going to carry that torch moving forward uh, just as like a person who's a fan of competition, fan of business, I'm always taking notes and, and find it interesting. But I know NBA in general, you're talking about Kevin, uh, you know, you're big on basketball, you hoop. I want to talk more about your personal hooping, but you okay. have, and we still have to get a run in by the way, <laughs> but uh, anytime, you have so any, many, anytime you want to make it down here, anytime you want to make it down. That's what I'm saying. I just got to pull, yeah. I just got to get down so I can see the coves yeah. in Laguna yeah, Beach yeah. and then like, we'll get a run in, but you have a lot of NBA relationships. Um, and I loved, I read something where you're talking about meeting LeBron and just in Le, probably your, your first times meeting him, acting like you've been there, not being a fan, not pulling your phone out and taking selfies and stuff. Um, like, I, I feel like even though this generation gets a rap for being all obsessed with social media and stuff, I'm, I'm starting to notice more that we're entering a space where people like understand that that's, that's the way to move. Like not everything is for everyone. You don't even have any social media. Um, so I thought that was a cool anecdote, but like beyond that anecdote, just what's the relationship like with LeBron? He's been a big supporter of, of hype rise from the beginning. And like, we know he's a supporter, but, but like, what's your friendship or your relationship? Like, like, is there anything that you've learned from him? I mean, this guy, we can be as chill about stuff as we want, but he is an all time global icon, arguably the greatest to ever do what he does. And like, you know, what, what comes of that relationship and is there things that you can just take with you? And you're like, yeah, LeBron, LeBron put me on this game and yeah, it's helped. Well, I, I think he was hugely influential in, in Hyperice and Normatech. So I think that like, if you look at Hyperice and Normatech, these two companies, uh, LeBron was, it was really after the 2011 NBA finals when they lost to Miami that Mike Mancius, who was, is, has, has been his like kind of trainer for gosh, going over on, on 20 years now, um, reached out and said, Hey, uh, you know, LeBron really wants to focus on his recovery because he felt that like he was a little gassed in the finals. And so he was looking for, for new stuff. And so, you know, like, Hey, you, you, we, what I had at the time was just the hyper ice, which was just like, he ices a lot. This is a way for you to do it more without, you know, he could do it at home. He could do it, you know, kind of anywhere um, without relying on like someone there to train, to, to ice them and wrap them. The Norma tech at that time, I think was like $5,000 and it made a lot of noise and it was pretty crude, but it really worked. So I think that, you know, early on, he was not only an adopter, but LeBron's also the type of guy that when he encounters something that works, um, he's definitely willing to share it with his friends. And LeBron has a lot of friends. And so, um, you know, where, where Kobe was totally different. Kobe was like, if there was some guy that gave him some, you know, some, some device or something special that gave him an advantage, he'd be like, okay, well, it's up to my competitors to figure out how to get it. You know, it's sort of, he looked at it almost like as he wasn't going to be the guy to go like you know start telling people about it. LeBron was totally the opposite. So when I met LeBron in 2011, um, the first thing he did was he was on a trip to China, so he told Carmelo and Chris Paul and Dwayne Wade was still Jordan Brand athlete then. 
And so it was like, and then he invited me to his charity game during the lockout. And, you know, the gift, the gift to all the players was, was a set of high price needs. And so like, that was, he's definitely a guy that for sure put, put me on the map with a lot of NBA players because I look back and a lot of the players I know that, um, and with COVID I haven't seen in a while, but just guys, you know, even guys that are retired, like Amari Stoudemire, I remember met, meeting him at LeBron's charity game and, um, guys like, you know, guys like Dwayne and Carmelo. And um, and so there was like him kind of like bringing me in because it was like, hey, if, if, if you if you were like if LeBron brought you there, like you were sort of, you know, you were sort of you were good. Right. Um, right. Over the over the years, I would see him every we were coming out with a new product like every year. So from there, it was like, you know, hey, 2014, I remember the summer that he when so after they lost to the heat after the heat lost to the, the spurs in the 2014 finals and you know there was rumor that he was gonna like uh go back to cleveland i remember going out to vegas he had his like nike lebron camp then and i gave him the prototype for the viper and like we talked that and he always whenever he saw me he kind of knew okay he's got like something new right because if, if whenever we had something new we'd always want to get his eyes on it first because you know, he would give good feedback, but also really more just because like we knew that you're planting a seed and he's going to tell other people about it. So um, I remember then it was like, you know, 2016 with the Venom. It was like, there was, there was constantly like this. Okay. Anytime there was something new, I did up Mike Mancius and then like, I'd go to his Nike camp or I'd go, I, I'd see him at different places. I remember one time meeting him at the peninsula to give him, uh, to give him a new product to get, to give him kind of first look at it. And I know Normatech kind of did the same and it's kind of no different. We just launched the Normatech Go recently and I got it to him pretty early on. Yeah, I got, I got it to him pretty early on and he's been really, really liking it. It's something that he kind of requested. He wanted a Normatech that he could play cards in. So this is kind of like address that. And so I guess he really liked it. And so I think um, I used to see him more frequently. I think the world of COVID kind of changed that because we kind of didn't see people for a long time and like, the, the facilities got super guarded even as until recently. Um, but I, I would say every time I would see him, he has a great memory, an unbelievable memory. Like he could remember like, Oh yeah, I remember like when you came in the summer of this and we talked. And, and so I think that in my conversations with him in the past has really always been about like, it's just, he's just an athlete looking for an edge. Like what, what can I do to like, you know, Hey, when, when, when should I use it? How should I use it? Like, I think always looking to crack that code because, and, and I, and I think that he's one of the athletes that has shown the least amount of drop off as he's gone on. Now, granted, he's a genetic freak. Um, and I mean that in the best way possible. But they say he, he spends a million dollars on his body. You know, they say he spends a million dollars a year yeah. on his body and well, I don't, yeah, you know, that's that. a number in the yeah. press. It's not like I heard it from him, yeah. but no, but that, you know, no uh, one doubts it. No one knows. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's funny that it's funny that Maverick Carter uh, was the one who said that in that interview that he spends a million dollars on his body. And I remember myself and the founder of Armatech said, um, "Hey, like of that million dollars, we haven't seen any of it because we always give him we always give him stuff for free. <laughs> so that must be that must he must have some. So he must have some expensive massage therapist because that's pretty much all. But no, I mean I, I think that you know when you factor in him traveling with therapists and trainers and all this stuff, it's you know, you know, it, it's sort of, um, it's sort of like the Will Chamberlain. I was, I, I was with 20,000 women kind of line where it's like, it might be an exaggeration, but the spirit of it is true that like, yeah, he spends a lot of money on his body, you know? Um, yeah, for sure. And, what about and, like and, life and business though? Like he's such like the recovery piece is apparent. He's like a prolific athlete. Um, but LeBron has done so much for culture because of how much he speaks to beyond the game. And is there just like anything personal um, that you all ever discussed or like, just you're like, Oh damn, that is some great advice from this guy. And it stuck with you. Yeah. No, I definitely had more of that relationship with Kobe than I did with LeBron. I think that, um, the only time I think like LeBron, what, when we launched the Hyper Bowl in 2018, we gave the first 15 units out to LeBron's team at the all-star game. It was like the, we went into the locker room on the, on the day before the game, gave it, and I had noticed that his kids had gotten a lot older since I first saw them because I first met him in, in 2011 and his kids were at the charity. Game and they were just like these little kids running around. And by 20, 
18, they were kind of like, you know, middle school and like they had gotten a lot bigger. And I would just be like, dang, like, it's crazy how much, how bigger, you know, we, and we kind of, and I had just had my own, my, I, I just had um, my, my first kid and I had another one on the way at the time. And I was just like, wow, it's sort of a, sort of a, a barometer for like your career. It's like, you see like your kid's age and how fast it happens. And he was just telling me like, you know, just, he just mentioned really quick how fast it goes. And um, I told him, I just told him, I just had a first son and Mike Mancius, who's LeBron's trainer, just had his first son. And we were all talking about being new dads and um, he's just like, enjoy it. Cause it goes really fast. He's like, you know, they're, he's like, they're getting, to, he's like, you know, I think you mentioned too, they're, they're getting to the age where I like, you know, uh, when, when you're, when your kids are young, like you're, they're so excited to see you every time. And then by the time they get to be teenagers, it's probably, you know, they, they kind of want to do their own thing. Um, but I never, I think LeBron likes conversations were always pretty much centered around work. Um, and a lot of times he doesn't have a lot of time. So for me to sit down, whereas Kobe was basically my neighbor, I live like five minutes away from him. And we had, we spent more time talking about stuff other than, other than basketball. And that was, so I, I think of between between those two guys who both helped the brand in different ways. Um, you know, LeBron was always really receptive well, Kobe, to new products. Co- yeah. Go ahead. Well, Kobe is just like you know super important to all of us, and I love um, hearing about the role that he played in Hyperize. And you've talked about it a bunch um, in terms of giving you early feedback not being a yes man and like really pushing you to, to innovate and to take things further. Um, so I can imagine that, but I'm wondering in the same way, especially like we all work to apply mama mentality to life, right? It's like, it's just a part of our culture that's going to live forever. It was, it was just Kobe day not too long ago. Um, it's his like birthday, his yeah. idea. Yeah. His birthday, the celebration and just his, his idea of how you approach life has persisted. And so you say you had more conversations like that with Kobe than LeBron, where it's a little more focused on work and recovery. What were some of the gems that you got from Mr. Kobe? Yeah. I, I I just had more, I just had way more time with him. Like when I would see LeBron, I would always be like at his camp and like, you know, you get, you get a set of time, you know, I want to use, I don't want to be respectful. So. I of course, but Kobe's issue. your neighbor, so you have the blessing of of yeah. access to one of the greatest minds. Like, you yeah. know, what what and, was that like? And I think I, I really got to know him in the summer of 2013 or the spring of 2013 when he did his Achilles. And so I think for him, it was the first time that he really had like a lot of downtime. Like he wasn't training. You know, he was in a, he was in a boot for a while. And so I think that at that time. I, I, I look at that time as the time where Kobe actually, you know, because pe- people probably don't realize this, but you know, he eventually got into doing a lot of other stuff. He won an Oscar for um, Dear Basketball. He was invested in a bunch of different ventures. He started Brian Stiebel with, um, and Not the firm. Which is super invest- early on Body invest- Armor. Yeah. But when I, at, into, before he did his Achilles, he was really not in anything. He had his endorsements, but he did. He spent very little time thinking about anything else other than basketball, because he was so singularly focused. He didn't play golf. He doesn't have any other hobbies. He was like basketball. And I remember something he told me when he, we were sitting at breakfast in, um, at Pelican Hill, and he had his boot on. And he goes, "You know, the thing about this is like." I never would ever think about retire. Like I, people ask about like, oh, when are you gonna retire? Because he was getting like a little bit older at the time, and he's like, I would never even let that thought sink in because I thought that was weakness. Like if I'm already thinking about the end, like if I'm healthy and I'm going, like why am I even thinking about stopping? Like you know, like I'll play until they drag me off the court. And when he got his Achilles, when he did his Achilles, I think he said, you know, this has made me realize like. Okay, I, I think his own more. I, I think it kind of like his own mortality set in, and it allowed his mind to go to life after basketball. Because if you look at all of his investment activity, all of the things that Kobe Inc. all that, it's all after the Achilles. Because until that point, he was so singularly focused on just winning more titles, um, and he was actually playing. You know, Dave McMenamin wrote a good article. I think it was about how well he was playing, or maybe it was Baxter Holmes wrote a good article about right before the Achilles leading up to that. 
they had kind of had like a rough start to the year, but they really were coming on. Kobe was really carrying that team, was playing a lot of minutes. And so in his mind, I think he was still like, if I didn't tear my Achilles, we were going to win the title in 2013, or we were going to, you know, you know, uh, or at least make a run at it. And so the Achilles, though, grounded him to the point where I think he was like, and, and one of the things he told me, he goes, I really just don't know anything about like some of the ventures that I want to be in. And so he went on this like obsessive, like learning mission for years where it was like, if he wanted to, before he did investments, he wanted to meet with Warren Buffett. If he wanted to learn about products and design, he reached out to Johnny Ive and got it. He was one of the only people ever to go into the Apple design studio that wasn't an Apple designer. Um, he was really, this is like, like he had this like unquenchable thirst for like knowledge and, and um, to, for me to see that firsthand of like, and I think for me, what he was interested in was like, I was, you know, I, I think there was no one that had a recovery brand and like I was, I had the first product I had developed the Viper, which he, had, he was kind of interested in see like where I wanted to go with that. And the idea of having a brand all based around recovery was something that he actually wanted Nike to, to, to work on a recovery line with him because he was sort of the guy that was really, really early. Remember like the stories of Kobe going to Dusseldorf, Germany to go to see Dr. Um, Dr. Welling and Hartman to do like the full body cryo and, and then to, you know, to, um, to do the stem cells, all, all the stuff that like, he was really early on because he was he was just looking to be to be able to say like what can i do to get my body in the optimal condition to play and i was someone that was like the only kind of the only person that had like a recovery break even though it was starting and it wasn't what it is today like i at least articulated the vision for like there's going to be like there's one day where i want a whole suite of technology like apple has that is all designed around the body and all the recovery and i think that idea fascinated him and i think it was something that he had taken a Nike on his own where he's like, I'm trying to get Nike to do that, but they won't do it. They'll only do clothes and shoes. And I think so our, our common interest was like us talking about like, Hey, what if we did this or what if we did that to the body? And like, you know, now some of these modalities that we're seeing kind of, you know, I, I think he would have loved the hyper X because he was really into thermal therapy. Right. Um, but in addition to that, we, we, we also talk, Kobe and I were the same age. So we grew up in the same sort of time. And so when it came to, we talked a lot about film. He was super, I, I'm a huge student of film and so is he. And we were both really into like Tarantino movies and, and he was really into Christopher Nolan and I was into David Fincher. We would talk all about like, um, and, and this is before he was in the content game at all. But um, I think his love for film kind of came out later on and that he wanted to do more storytelling. And so I just had way more, conversation with Kobe that were not that were not just about basketball that were more sort of holistic about you know um, everything from he was super into branding and marketing he did have a, a, a you know he was you know I, I think that was something that it, part of his like sort of Nike relationship was that he was involved in sort of the concepting of you know things like the Kobe system for the Kobe 7 and a bunch of stuff like that and um, so I think uh, we shared a similar like curiosity about the world and we were the same age. And like, that's why I think that, you know, I had a lot more sort of depth to our relationship than I've had with other athletes. Yeah. Um, you talk. I, about... I, have a great, I, I, I have one great Kobe story though. If, I, I don't think I've ever, I've only told it to, I don't ever told it on camera. If, if, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, please do. I think I, I, so so it's, it's 2012 and it's USA basketball. And a lot of people didn't know if Kobe was going to play in 2012 because he was kind of like, you know, you know, getting a little bit older. And a lot of times when guys win a gold medal, they kind of like let the next generation go. But all the guys that won the Redeem team in their 2008 were most of them were coming back. LeBron came back. Chris came back. Kevin came back. Oh, no, Kevin wasn't even on 08. So um, he was on 12. And then, and so Kobe had come back and, and Kobe was going to be the veteran. And so we had this thing with USA basketball where um, we had agreed to basically provide like a USA basketball branded high price set of needs for every player. So we had gone out, the, the, the team always met July 7th in Vegas um, at the Wynn hotel. And that's where like you checked in and coach K was there and you know, they all kind of like hang out the night before meeting the next day and then they were going to it. And so um, Kobe was just coming off. Like it was sort of like LeBron had just won his first title. So, it was sort of like LeBron's league now. And, and Kobe, the, the Lakers had got bounced in 11 by the Dallas Mavericks who won the title. And then in 2012, they got bounced by the Oklahoma City Thunder who actually went to the finals. 
And I think there was this kind of feeling around the league where like, okay, the Lakers are kind of like, they're probably, they're probably done. Like they, they won in 09 and 10. And, and now like the, the, the Oklahoma was younger and had a much brighter future. And it was sort of like, it was Kobe and Powell and they kind of like the, some of the other guys weren't, you know, as good uh, they were, had kind of dropped off. But on July 4th, the Lakers signed Steve Nash and Dwight Howard agreed to go there. So like, it was like, whoa, the Lakers are going to get Dwight, who is still like kind of you know more closer to his prime, and Steve, who was still playing at a high level. So the thinking was that like, wait a minute, like just when Oklahoma looked like they were going to make the next couple finals, like now you have the Lakers kind of adding these two pieces, and they're going to be good, making a run. Yeah. And I think, and I think Kobe was always big about sending messages, and so I remember the day we got there at check in. It's July seventh, and all the players are there, and I go out, I go out to the. Um, you know, I got to, we went through this one entrance, we go out to the pool and like Tyson Chandler's there and I, in front of him and kind of, and Kevin Love was there and Blake Griffin was there and guys were like relaxing because like they're about to go through like a pretty extensive training. So it was like kind of out by the pool. They had sectioned off a private section. And I went into, and then I had to go to the lobby to like go check in and Robert Lars, Kobe's security guard, and he's like pacing and he's like, he's like on a walkie talkie or on the call and he's just like shaking his head. I'm like, oh, this is weird. Like he's always usually with Kobe. And he's and, and I could see like he's kind of concerned. And so me and I was with Robbie Davis, who's a trainer and friend of mine. I said we said, hey, what's what's going on? And he said, Kobe, man, this guy's nuts. And we're like, what do you do? He goes, well, we got here, and it's 104 degrees in Vegas in July. And he goes, he decides that he wants right. to go on a bike ride. He wants to go on a 40 mile bike ride. So what? Totally unplanned. We got it. So he goes, we had to send someone to go to the bike store, get a bike that would fit him like a high-end bike. We're gonna, so we like, we like, I don't even know if they could rent it. I think they had to buy it. He had to get the helmet. He had to get all the gear. And it was like, I want to do this now. And so they needed a sort of a caravan to kind of, you know, to have Kobe go to the desert. So you, you have this guy that's, you know, in his, you know, in his thirties, like kind of one of the older players. And he's, you know, got a, basically, instead of having an off season, he's about to go play an Olympic run. And, and that's pretty hard on the body, but, he wants to go on this bike ride. Now, the, the, it just taps. It, this says so much about him, and, and this is the reason why I did it. He has no interest in riding a bike. He didn't care about it. It wasn't like it was like his hobby or anything like that. He just wanted to send the message to everyone there because think about it. LeBron was on that team. Kevin Durant was on that team. All the guys, like Durant, the new guy that, in, in Westbrook was on that team. So the guys that James Harden was on the team. So the guy, you know, Durant Harden. The whole Westbrook. next generation of stars he has yes, was right on that there team. with them. And, and what he, which why he did that is because he wanted to be able to say like, and, and I remember like all the players, the young guys like Blake and Kevin were like all kind of giddy. Like, did you hear about what he's doing? <laughs> you know, like they're like he's freaking riding a, like he's on a forty mile bike, and he wanted that to get out. He wanted everyone to know because he just wanted to send a message. It's like, hey, I know, I know you guys think that I might be old and that like we haven't made it to the finals the last two years, but while you're at the pool. Um, I'm I'm gonna go go on a 40 mile bike ride in 140 degree heat, and I'm gonna come to practice tomorrow. I'm gonna be the first guy on the floor, and it's just to put that in their head, and like that's just how crazy he was, and 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 just the like the mind games that like he's playing. Like he was probably not enjoying what he was doing. Like it's not like he just wanted to challenge himself, but really not even because he had nothing else to prove to himself. It was really more like. I'm just going to send a message to these guys. If they think I'm done, they're sort of, they're sort of mistaken. And I just always thought that was just a, hilar a hilarious way to do it. And it was kind of like in 2008, you would do the same thing where practice was guys would have to meet in the lobby at 830 for breakfast or eight o'clock for practice at nine. And Kobe would have a six o'clock workout and he'd be icing his knees, reading the paper. And the guys would come in for breakfast and be like, oh, you guys are just getting here. I already have my work. You guys are lazy. And it's sort of the same thing. It's the it's like, yeah, it's like it, it but it, I think you know, in 08, that I think some of the guys were kind of like, okay, like I thought we were all going to be like friends on this team, and, and he was sort of kind of taking that sort of stance. But I think by 12, they just was like, man, you guys are crazy. And and it's Kobe, and then to do that in crazy, 08 crazy and dedicated, and when in 09 and 10, like he sent that message, went and did it. Um, such yeah. an icon. It's an ins inspiration to, to, to all. I always just thought that story just kind of sum, sums up sums up how that story how, is how incredible. 
Yeah, that yeah. story is incredible and totally like the type of inspiration that we look to Kobe for, like challenging yourself, you know, having no fear in situations. A lot of it reminds me um, of stories in his Mamba Mentality book. Never heard that one, though, but there's a lot of that sending messages or I love like the humble part where he's going up and asking Jordan, asking these other people questions and just being like so curious for knowledge, like you were saying earlier. And I thought about this from that book when you talk about how he had like this early vision when it comes to recovery that one of my favorite stories in that book and like favorite chapters, so to speak, is just him talking about taping, like the art to it and like the type of recovery work that he would do. It was just as interesting as hearing him talk about LeBron or Jordan or what have you. It was just like, this dude does everything to the fullest extent. He's going to give you a totally compelling chapter just about how he trains and recovers um, that just has just as much passion and art to it as anything else. And that always stuck with me. And I, and, and I really feel like, you know, part of the tragedy um, among many other things, but he was just getting started. Like you said, after he retired from basketball, that's when he started really taking off in business. And I would have loved to seen, you know, how far he could have took things there, but certainly left behind a legacy um, in pretty much every arena that he went for. That yeah, I mean, there, there's never before. there's never going to be an athlete that um, that wins an Oscar the year after they retire. It just won't happen. Yeah, so that was yeah, a, it's incredible. Yeah, the so fact that speaking, he no time. And, yeah. yeah, he got right to it. And speaking of the arts mm-hmm. and Oscars and. Uh, you said you and Kobe had a relationship talking about film quite a bit. You mentioned Arcade Fire earlier, which, by the way, isn't Wake Up on the Funeral album? Yeah, it's also it was also the song that Spike Jones used for Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah, Philly. you're right. But that mm-hmm. that record, my favorite is um, Neighborhood 3, Power Out. Like, that one's crazy. And I also loved the Neon Bible album, like No, no Cars Go and... Yeah, they have this, uh, they have such a crazy loyal following. Um, sort of. I like saw I the... saw them tour uh, suburbs at Madison Square Garden, which was pretty sick. Um, well, it speaking seems... of, I don't know. Yeah, speaking of Madison Square Garden, one of my favorite bands ever is Rage Against the Machine, and they just played five nights at Madison Square Garden recently. All so they sold out five nights. So um, sick. I I love so... like artists who have established themselves just for good. And they can always tour. They can always pull an audience. Like, you know, once you're iconic, you're iconic. And Rage, Rage certainly fits the bill. I'm going to see um, New Order this fall, Kendrick. Like, music is really important to me. But you've mentioned that before, being a child of the 90s, being around before, like, the internet was everywhere and, like, your consumption of arts. You're here telling me stories about your friendship with Kobe Bryant and part of it is about art and film and Tarantino. Um, can you expound on that? Cause I've heard you mention it a couple of times, but I've never really heard you get into like your love for art and film. And I think, look, we all love the arts, but how does that stuff inspire you as a businessman and as like a leader of, of hyper ice? Like, is there some overlap yeah. there that informs how you you view the company and like what you want to accomplish oh, yeah. with it? I mean, I think just unquestionably, like my my influences from when, from my youth have shaped how I see the world, and there's you know a sort of an art and a science to to high price that like is so is so taken from the from my time as a young person. I, I feel that I always feel that from age about. 15 to 25. Like when, whenever you talk music with people, you know, the, people say, oh, what was the best decade? Like what, what was the best time for music? And pretty much everyone to a, to a man or woman will say that it's always the time, their favorite time always happens to line up between like age, like 15 and 25. Because also, that's Anthony, really you know, of, a study yeah. just came out like, a couple of weeks ago about how people stop listening to new music like after 30 like you pretty yeah. much get stuck on that decade yeah. you're talking about so i know exactly what you mean and i'm kind yeah, of falling into it in my early 30s by the way i've always been a pop culture obsessive and always kept up with the new stuff i didn't even know the vmas were on the other night that used to be my olympics dude like oh, i used to be yeah. like 
I used to be like, I'll That's never it. fall off from pop culture. And now I'm like listening to Miles Davis and throwing on in utero and, and just yeah. like completely uninterested sometimes in what's happening now. But well, I think it's just about- natural. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's natural that like, number one, you're way more impressionable. And, and from, you know, when you're a kid, you know, you, there's things that are more nostalgic to your childhood. Right. So like, you know, my, my childhood is more like, you know, you know, in the eighties, the golden, you know, sort of like the, the first decade of MTV where you got like, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I remember coming home from school and seeing like Michael Jackson thriller and, you know, like sort of like that sort of early, you know, the, the eighties, but we're, we're, it, it was sort of, I had really no like interaction with like the emotions of it. It was just sort of like, kind of like you're a kid and you're entertained. When you, when you turn around like 15, you know, you go to high school and back then the music you listened to kind of like shaped what kind of person you were, what kind of friends you hung out with. Um, it like said something about you and we had more shared culture back then because it wasn't the time of like kind of curated sort of experiences we shared more. And, and so from age 15 to 25, think about what happens during that time. You go through high school, you go through college, you know, you probably get, you get your heart broken, you fall in love, whatever, whatever, all that, all that's happening during that time. You know, you, you, you have these friends in high school, then you, you kind of go away and like, you know, there's this dynamic of like, uh, you know, kind of, so like preserving this, like this time in your life, that's never going to come back again. Right. And so the music during that time that you're listening to, you know, the becoming the soundtrack of your life, there, there's nothing that's going to ever compare to that. Like, even if I fell in love with the song today, it just, I'm at such a different point in my life where it just wouldn't be the same. Like my, my uh, you know, we connect with music in a physical way, just like, you know, a radio connects with the radio wave, the vibrations of, sound and connecting with the ball on the radio and it makes a connection in our bodies kind of do the same thing there's a physical connection we have but there's also this the experience you know when you get older like i think about it now um you know i used to be like i used to just love to drive and listen to music you live in southern california you drive a lot listen to music and you know that's back when i didn't have in the 90s didn't have, didn't have a cell phone didn't have a job that i needed to be on calls for didn't have a family i had to go home to so like you just have way more time and it just meant what, what means a lot more to you. And so for me, you know, music was super important to like shaping how I saw the world. But I also feel the nineties were a time where like, you know, there's all these different art forms. There's film, there's music, you know, there's, there's fashion, there's, there's, there's performing arts, whatever. I feel like that what was unique about the nineties was that like, I really feel like that music was like the lead art form that was influencing the other art forms. Right. A major way I would say that is that that music video was such a dominant platform for entertainment that you couldn't like there was two sort of forms of fame right you got to either be famous on a movie screen or a TV screen and musicians had to break through on MTV before they would get like culturally relevant and so you know what what really it led to was a lot of some really great music video directors becoming film directors and I felt like music video was really kind of pushing film and Kind of if you look at the history of film, it kind of goes in these like these and, and music too goes in these like kind of arcs and waves and pendulums where it's like, you know, you have like film noir, this sort of dark time in the forties with movies like Citizen Kane and, and um, that were sort of post World War II, like it was a little bit darker. And in the fifties, you have this like sort of American hero story kind of conformity and like that's sort of the music kind of reflects that. And then you get into like the mid sixties, and then you have like the counterculture movement, and then like you, you sort of have like the, the, the empowered director kind of stories get darker. And then by the time the 80s come, you get this, like, going back to the action hero, uh, you know, like, time. John Hughes you know, like, Jones. Yeah, and then Indiana Jones and sort of, like, this sort of, everything, the, the action adventure was the dominant sort of, um, sort of, uh, you know, genre. And then in the 90s, you know, like, I always feel like, like, Nevermind comes out and, like, sort of smashes the whole, like, idea of this, like, big performance with big hair and like sort of it was guys going out in flannels and no set design and just playing music and it was all about substance not the sort of like kind of show around it and so like that whole that set the entire tone for the 90s of like this like minimalism in art where you had the stripping like like you 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 go look at a fashion show after like alter, alternative music to me like really kind of broke the whole decade like that was the beginning hey, of like the grunge collection Mark Jacobs had a grunge yeah. collection, you know? Yeah, And, and, and also, started, I was slightly yeah, younger than yeah, you in the early yeah. 90s, and I always am like, wow, never mind. And then you get the chronic, like, a year later. Yeah. The culture must have just, like, completely blown open. 
Well, it was it was sort of the it was sort of the, the this golden age of both rap uh, of like like rap music, hip hop, and rock at the same time, right? You had these like iconic bands and iconic artists, um, kind of like coming up at the same time. It wasn't like where you had this like oh where you know you had this you know one was a dominant and then like the other took charge. It was like at, at simultaneously you had you had the two dominant art forms of that time, like rock music and alternative music and rap hip hop, like sort of having this like coming of age moment where they were really sort of defining the culture. And I think that when you look at film, it sort of carried over because like Pulp Fiction was kind of like the Nirvana's Nevermind, right? It was a movie that just completely like broke the mold of like, hey, long dialogue, character driven story told out of order, gritty, the anti-hero. And that's really kind of the anti-hero became sort of this big thing in the 90s, common theme in film. And I just feel that like the art of the 90s really kind of sh- it was reflected in, in in brands like even like in my community in surf culture like in the 80s it was like gotcha quicksilver billabong these bright colors and like neons were like representing surf culture and then that just kind of got completely stripped down because music influenced it and then it became more blacks and solids of like the skate culture and that was like kind of the rise of skate culture as well and then you saw like bands like the beastie boys like tap into the skate culture by like you know spike jones does you know, has this like cult skate movie. They hired a music video. And you started to see this like kind of crossing over between like the sort of this like the, the, what was happening in the music industry. And then like that translated to music video. Music video carried over to, to, um, to movies because David Fincher obviously became like this most, one of the most successful directors who came out of music video. Sevens. And so, so, I, so I think that like, yeah, seven and 95 and the game in 97 and Fight Club in 99. Also, like, you have this. I know you were a history dude because you were a years person. Yeah, and, like yeah, I'm the same way, and my family kind of like makes fun of me for it for it sometimes because they'll be like, "Ernest, can you ever just like mention something without being like, oh yeah, that was in like October '97, yeah. and I remember when that happened.' But I love talking to you because I'm like, finally, someone else who is so referential yeah. with years. Yeah, it's important because if you, if you understand the chronology, you understand what 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 impacted what. So you know, you kind of feel like. I, I just feel like the 90s was just like sort of golden age of we still had shared culture, right? It was before the monoculture, which we have now, which is the algorithms essentially curate content to your liking. Like I always joke that like no one could say I hate that song now because you don't hear a song you hate anymore. <laughs> you know, it's not fed to you. Whereas like when we're in the monoculture, you watch a block of videos on MTV, you have to sit there and wait for your, the one you wanted to come on and you have to interact with stuff you didn't like. And now it's just a difference. Um, but I so think that that's the golden so, so that it very much it very much shaped me like I'm just very shaped by sort of you know counterculture brands at that time and it's funny that like Nike and Apple were the counterculture brands they were more of the they were not the you know Microsoft was the established and Apple was like the artist brand uh, you know in, in in Reebok was like the establishment Nike was sort of like the cooler brand that I thought spoke to me a lot more um, in surfing like Volcom was the um, the brand that that to me, um, you know, really spoke to me a lot more than the traditional surf brands did, and because it brought in music and skate culture and snowboard culture. Um, well, that's and I'm so I feel like it's like you're yeah. building this company uh, in the 2020s. You know, we're both obsessed mm-hmm. with our years. Now we are 30 years removed from this golden age. So how do you like retain uh, the things that you liked about that moment, and like how did it inform how you approach the branding of your business, and ultimately just yeah. like what you want to offer to the culture? Well, I, I do think that like, you know, I, I just don't think that like recycling the just the art from, from that time is, is, is well served for a consumer brand because, you know, I, I think it's really taking the spirit of that time. Not that, not the like, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very progressive in the way I approach, um, I approach when we shoot content, right? Photography or film. I'm always looking at like what is the latest lighting technique or camera lens or what's something we can do that we could visually communicate. And I just got off a really cool project we just did for the launch of the new Venom. And it was very modern and very, very like, you know, sort of, um, it feels really fresh. And, but the spirit of it is like, you know, the, you know, the, you don't like constantly think like, okay, how am I going to implement like the 90s into this? It's more just, one of the spirit of the nineties was like to think outside the box and like to like try to push and be a little avant-garde. And you know, you have like, you know, you know, like Tom Ford made his rise in the nineties. So did Alexander McQueen and guys that like, who was super outside the box and like, 
in a commercial in a commercial sort of consumer brand, you can't I can't be the I, I can't go so far outside where like I'm doing things that are just purely conceptual and not connecting at all. Like we are a brand that has products that have a, a specific function and utility and then we have to educate people. So I don't have the full freedom to like to like take, you know, I mean, you know, I look back to the fashion photography of the nineties, I'm a huge Helmut Newton fan and like, I can't really put that into my brand. It just doesn't make sense. Like it's, so it's not about forcing your influences into your brand. It's really more about the mindset of I'm going to um, think outside the box and take this approach when visually communicating. And there's something in the spirit of the nineties is just that like it was breaking molds and not doing things the conventional way. And if you kind of have that sort of general attitude towards what you're doing, I think that like that's how it lives on, but not it's not just taking a certain aesthetic and just re, and just like you know re, you're refurbishing it. Right. In fashion, you, you can do that, right? Look. Like yeah. I walk around yeah. everywhere, fashion I, I see I see everyone, I see all these girls wearing. Yeah, exactly. But but fashion is actually you actually wear the same thing, right? Like I see girls wearing. Well, why are the kids dressed yeah. and the kids are? I I went to something with my wife the other night, and we go to our concerts, and so you see the twenty year olds. And I'm like, is it 2003? Because that's how everyone is dressed now. And it's really cool because I remember being in high school and looking at the 80s and being like, oh, man, I want to get I want to pop the collar on my eyes on and I want to, you know, like go and listen to Public Enemy and like just that was cool. And that was vintage. And now that has happened uh, with my era. But, yeah, it's not like you need. We don't need, you're not going to try to replicate an aesthetic, but I think the spirit of what Quentin brought to the table with Pulp Fiction, what Dr. Dre and and Nirvana brought with Nevermind the Chronic, it's just like, how can we, how can we challenge the status quo a little bit with this and, and keep it, you know, fresh and original. So yeah, there's a, there's a certain dark edge to it. And, and like, I feel like, um, the spirit of that is just like it, it influences you in a way just, just to want to be creative. That's the other thing. Like it can it can look nothing like I would say that it looks nothing like um, you know, and there there's times where like, you know, when I was watching Kill Bill the other night when she's like silhouetted in the kung fu scene and like that's we have we have some silhouette stuff in our recent stuff, and I'm like, okay, did you know that's maybe why I like silhouette stuff because it comes from because it comes from that. But it's not really even about that, it's just that. I just think that that it inspired me to to see how impactful the creative arts were on me, like how big film was impactful on me, how how impactful music was on me. It like it 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 inspires your creativity to go do something maybe totally different, has nothing to do. You can't even it's it's, you can't you're not referencing it. It's just that like I want to do something creative that will have an impact, and that's ultimately like to me what what high price is, and and mostly through products and, and visuals, but. I definitely think that totally. my influence yeah, from that like, my influence, yeah, caused me to be creative. Exactly. It's like, it's just about the larger sense of creating something that matters and like, you know, changes the world in some type of way. And I think that that's a, a noble cause. And I think, you know, we're talking about all these artists. Uh, Apple comes up a lot. I'm curious, how is Hyper Ice like performing essentially right now uh, we see we've seen so many partnerships over the years uh these new products keep coming out and what's like the next jump essentially you know apple went from being the counterculture kids in the 80s and even you know through the 90s um never mind the whole but even look even steve leaving you get pixar you get he comes back in 97 like we could we could get in uh, and nerd out on that all day um but before we get sidetracked, because I know we're both history, pop culture, Apple nerds, and we could just talk for an hour about that. Um, how does Hyper Ice break out? Like, like who would have envisioned in 85 when the Macintosh is dropping that this is like a $3 trillion company, you know, who is the establishment? Um, how does, like, Hyper Ice, I know you're not, you've mentioned not necessarily being, like, motivated just by making money, but you know, you want this thing to be as impactful as possible. So how does Hyper Ice go from very popular to like one of those all time, you know, culturally uh, important brands? That, yeah, I mean, look, that's obviously the mission is to have as big an impact as possible. Um, you know, I think very true to our core has always been, I always see product development through the lens of performance is like, how can I impact the body 
to make to, to, to trigger a response that's going to make it recover faster, warm up more optimally. Um, you know, when I wake up out of you know, I I do my norm check every night for 45 minutes. I wake out of bed, I have I have fresh bouncy legs. Like like how do we keep coming up with products that like truly enhance our ability? And you know, there was a uh, there was a I think it was Scientific American published something years ago. It's this famous thing where they, they looked at the entire animal kingdom and they looked at it as like what they looked at the locomotion of, uh, of, of animals and they looked at, um, you know, the efficiency of how animals move and on the very, you know, the, you know everything from like bears to the cheetah, which is the fast animal. And, and like humans were kind of like in the middle just like as a, just like as an animal and the condor was like number one and um but this the person who did the study was smart enough to say okay now we give the human a bicycle and then humans go from like the middle of the pack and they go all the way to number one steve jobs references this study actually in one of his interviews he did and what it really showed is that the difference between humans and other animals is that we're tool builders, we're, we're tool makers, right? And we have the imagination to build tools that enhance our ability. And to me, that's a really powerful thing to understand is that, you know, as humans, we're going to age and we're going to, we're going to reach our peak in our twenties. And then we're going to, it's going to kind of all, all be downhill, but as tool makers, we can, come up with things that actually change that arc so that we're not deteriorating as fast. Like the arc of the, the, the you know, the, the human of like, you know, you, you're born, you grow through adolescence, you go, you hit your peak and then like you like slowly drop off. And that's why all careers kind of in, in sports kind of mimic this arc. And so left to our own devices, all, all animals have, you know, this sort of like this, this, this like kind of same arc in our life. But just as, we went from the middle of the pack to the most efficient animal with a, with a bicycle because it was a tool that our, we're the only ones that have the imagination to build a tool that complex that kind of changes our efficiency and our ability is that we have the power to create, create tools that enhance our ability and enhance our longevity and improve sort of the quality of, of each day. And when, no, and understanding that when you go as a product developer, when you're developing performance products, that have also a utility and just general health and utility and getting people out of pain. Um, <clears throat> I think you, we, we, we can take the human from just seeing sort of being you know, subject to the laws of aging into, Hey, we can actually slow that process and reverse that process um, through technology. And as long as that dynamic exists, I think that, there's going to be, look, we're all trying to look for the fountain of youth. You see it in skincare, you see it in like what people do to their bodies. I think where we come in is, is really kind of on the sort of performance side and the wellness side of how do we keep the body moving? Because if we can keep the body moving, it's essentially slowing that process. And, you know, maybe, it, you know, it changes the arc of like, you know, it, you know, it enhances our ability to preserve our physical, um, like our physical prime for longer and, and slow the slow the deterioration of aging, and I think that's been the most exciting thing the last you know ten years. And what what I think I've, we've been a part of here is to play a part in that. That this is the time where like humans now have the ability to use technology to so that we're just like less subject to like this. Hey, this is just I'm gonna hey uh, as the years go by, I'm just gonna age and I'm gonna lose movement and then I'm gonna die. And like we can I challenge. think we're. we're we're, we're, we're in the early innings of, of being able to figure out a way to slow that down and look someday it might be in tapping into our DNA and changing the way we age. I know that, that I saw an article yesterday about like, there's a, this jellyfish that they call the immortal jellyfish because it doesn't age. And like, what is it about their DNA, their genetic code that allows them to do that? And maybe there's someday where we all, we all look like we're 25 when we're 80, but until, until that happens, um, you know, we're, we're trying to use technology to like improve the efficiency and the ability of the body. And so as long as that is out there, I think that the technology is going to get smaller, more efficient. It's going to, it's going to disappear into different forms like apparel and things like that. I think there's 
a lot of opportunity to, to continue to take what we've done in the early stages and to continue to refine that. And I don't know that there, you know, is there going to be this next, like, you know, the, the iPhone or this, this, this transcendent thing, of, you know, that might, that might come from the physical scientists who work more with the, with the, with the body's, you know, gene profile. But I definitely think that we're on a, uh, we sort of, we're ahead of the game in, in the way we look at things. Um, when it comes to the body and enhancing ability. Yeah. I, I look forward to what you all bring to the table. I'll look at, you know, whether I'm reading or something comes up on TikTok and you see an 80 year old who's incredibly fit and active. And I'll just think like, can we make that the standard? Like, can we as a species evolve to where that is commonplace and it is, you know, it's not an outlier. So, um, you know, I think hyper ice is definitely, in a position to help advance that. Uh, the last thing that I'll ask you, and and thanks for just keeping it so real with me this whole time and taking your time. Uh, <laughs> to, like this, that Kobe story is gonna stick with me forever. So I appreciate that. Um, but the athletes, you work with the best athletes in the world. So Patrick Mahomes, John Morant, Naomi Osaka, just to name a few. Um, how do you find that they connect with the work that you're doing um of course i can imagine they are athletes they want to recover better they want to have their bodies stay in peak position uh for as long as possible um but you know how do you find that just hyper ice specifically how they connect with uh you all's approach to this business and uh, the products that you're putting out, you know, maybe I don't know how to what extent people are involved. You know, you talk about like LeBron being able to help you test things out. Similar to like earlier, we talked about all the partnerships. You're you're plugged in with all the leagues, um, but there is a deeper meaning to it. And it was more like a stamp of approval for you. So when we see John, ja, Naomi, JJ Watt, like all these different people that you're working with, like what should we be mindful of uh, outside looking in about like what that really represents outside of the fact that you all have clout and work with celebrities? Like, like what do you find that relationship to really evoke? You know, I, I go back to like the, when we, how we opened about being like relationship centered is that like, to me, the sort of the best part is that like, I've actually in working with the athletes, I just kind of more see it as like, I think I've developed some, some good friendships with, with some of the ones I've gotten close to. And, you know, I think that that's sort of the biggest reward for doing good work is that it allows you to kind of, you know, meet people that you never would have been able to meet before. Um, you know, like you mentioned Mahomes, Mahomes grew up in Tyler, Texas. and I don't know anyone from Tyler, Texas. And, uh, you know, um, we're told we're, I'm probably, you know, 20 years older than him maybe or so um and but my work brought me to you know we're connected through my work and and we meet and the first time we met we just had this great conversation and he wanted to hear about my story and i want to hear about his and um you know i'm, I'm speaking on a panel in a couple of weeks with Lindsay vaughn who's the greatest skier of all time and you know i i've gotten to know kelly slater pretty well the greatest surfer of all time and um you know, a lot of players in the NBA and, and sort of, I think that's the biggest thing for me is, um, and maybe it's, I hope it's not, it doesn't come across as selfish, but just that, you know, getting to know people that are the best in the world is pretty fun. You know, um, you know, getting to like have a relationship with it outside of just like, you know, look, all the athletes are kind of looking for the same thing. They're just looking for, you know, like just better ways to, to get their bodies to be at peak performance. Right. Um, and that's sort of the give in between all of them. But beyond that, I really feel like for me, the most satisfying part has been, um, you know, you have the friends that you're kind of by proximity when you're young, the people who like go to school with you and then play on your sports teams and that you get connected to. And, you know, maybe you go to college somewhere else and you meet people from all over. But like when I would, the, 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 the part of my job that is far superior now to when I was a high school teacher is that when you're a high school teacher, your whole network is sort of like, within this like five mile radius of the building, right? It's like, 
parents and kids in this community. But, you know, now I, I know people from all over the world that are in, in, in content too. Like I've shot content on different continents and, um, you know, with working with different artists from all over, it's like my network of people is so broad when it comes to backgrounds, um, people from different countries all over the world and meeting people that you develop close relationships with. And it's like, you know, going around the world and I got like a friend in every country, uh, you know, pretty much through, and it's all because of my work. And that never would have happened if I stayed as a high school teacher. So for, for like the part where it might've sounded like I was, you know, kind of saying, Oh, in the business world, you don't meet as many, like you meet people like that, but also you meet a lot of great people too. It's like anything else. Right. And so, I think but the most enriching part for me is just been the relationships that I'll take, you know, long after um, you know, they'll they'll find someone better to do this job and and but I'll still have the relationships at that point. So I think for me, that's kind of been the most rewarding. Awesome. Well, looking forward to what High Price does in the coming years. It's been a lot of fun to watch the evolution. Um, you know, I've I've used some of the products. I've honestly used them on my wife more than myself. She's a real big fan, but yeah, dude, thank you um, for giving me some insight into, you know, the real story behind the company and, and in a lot of ways, your story. And like, I'm hoping to inspire some people or when people wonder, they see uh, Hyper Ice and all of a sudden, you know, it's all over the place. Like what, what's really behind that? You know, it's not just press releases going out and things happening. There's real like heart and passion and stories and spirit behind this. And um, loved hearing more about yours. I appreciate the time. And um, uh, ever since we got introduced, I uh, always felt we have a uh, great talks every time. So um, stay in touch and um, thanks for having me on. Yeah. If I, if I get down to Laguna and we have that elusive run, uh, what can I expect from you on the court? Like, are you, are you we're, still we're, out there balling crazy? Are you a shooter? Yeah. Are you a hustle guy? My, Cause I want to come and be ready. I, I, I've, I've, I've gotten myself to where my body feels good every time. Cause I just, that's just something I know. Like if there's no guesswork, like I know exactly how to get my body right for every run, but whether or not the shots go down that night, that's just a total it's that's just the mystery right it's the mystery of the streak shooter there's nights where it goes nights it doesn't but if you can if your body feels physically good and you and, and I'm, I'm i'm really competitive so I, I play hard so i'll always I'll always defend and and, and and compete it's just a matter of the, the the big variance is if the shots go down or not last week i had a pretty bad shooting night. i'm still pretty pissed so i gotta get we're playing on thursday so hopefully i get it back all right well Good luck out there. And if you miss and we're on the same squad, I'll try to get the boards. I have a whole strategy, all right? All right. We'll, 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 um, keep in touch anytime. If you want to get down for a run, let me know. All right. Cool, man. Talk soon. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. That's a wrap on another episode of the My Other Passion podcast. I want to thank Anthony Katz for coming out, telling us a story about how he built Hype Rice from the ground up. Also, that Kobe story was pretty amazing. I've always been a believer in Mamba mentality, but, you know, it really drives it home hearing stories like that that you never heard before. And it, it leaves an imprint on you. In general, Anthony's whole story, Hype Rice's whole story, you know, the fact that this was a brand new product 10 years ago and now it's all over the world. It's all over all these different sports. That's what I like to hear. And ultimately, that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this podcast. Give people a little bit of an insight into you know, who people are, what really goes on behind these companies. And I'm enjoying how it's going so far. I hope you're enjoying it, whether this is your first episode or you've been listening from the beginning. I appreciate it. We'll be back next Wednesday, as always, with another guest. Until then, I'm out.